phone? Is it that? I mean, I wonder. Uh, maybe it's weird, though. Can maybe, it maybe possibly be that Facebook is well, it's dumb? probably Facebook Live. All right, well, I don't know what Zuckerberg and those types are doing. So we're going to, this session is going to be recorded and, and uh, the video will be shared later on. So you can catch up with it. Um, and uh, of course, watch this, the splendor of our erudition yet again uh, a little later on. We're going to be focusing on tourism on today's program. And I was thinking about this, Narissa and I were talking about it last week in the context of some of the statements that were made about Carnival in the wake of Carnival. Everyone was saying that Carnival was a tremendous success. I don't recall ever having heard that Carnival was not a success, but that's what people are inclined well, to say. Well, as a reporter, yeah. um, the post-mortem for Carnival, you always get those press releases. Mm. It was a resounding success, yeah. but nobody ever really... Uh, quantifies or explains what, what, what that means what does that mean and that's that's an important point uh, now does that mean the fets did well because on the face of it looking at some of the, the the photographs that we've seen some of the videos that we've seen yes the fets seem to have done well some fets went the way of the dodo but most seem to have done very well the traditional big ones uh, carnival bands did well yeah they, they eat a proper food they, they sold out their costumes uh, but what does that 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 suggests that it did well domestically but what does it mean in terms of foreign exchange earning and I think that that's one of the more important points because we're, as we're talking about tourism that's not something that we we really measure is it well it's something we should measure mm. um, I mean you get you get the figure the rough figures of tourist arrivals mm. but that doesn't really give you a sense of what kind of money was actually generated by the fact that's net foreign exchange that yeah, is the foreign exchange after the foreign exchange that was spent to put mm -hmm. on the festival. Mm. And, and I mean, it's, it's crazy that we... Do we ever get those figures? Well, I remember uh, one year... Uh, I don't ever recall. A minister saying mm -hmm. that um, the festival attracted 40,000 people. No, I mean in terms of net foreign exchange. Oh, no, no, no. Do I have, we ever get those figures? No, I, I, I've never... Uh, seen those figures I've never read them um, so but the, but the reason that we we bring that up again is because carnival is touted as one of our major if not our major tourism product mm -hmm. and if we don't have an understanding of just how much foreign exchange which is that's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day how much foreign exchange this festival generates then that doesn't really say much for tourism policy planning, does it? But we're not really big on policy planning in this country. We talk a lot about policy, but we don't really talk about policy planning. Uh, but but we, we thought we would uh, start the program off in the context of the, the pronouncements about Carnival and its success because we want to talk about the bigger picture when it comes to tourism and it's not just carnival as far as we see it well the yeah. other question apart from how much net foreign exchange does carnival earn each year the other question is what happens in terms of tourism what happens after carnival right because that we have we have 363 other days to contend with outside of the two days that um carnival that represents carnival in Trinidad and Tobago and you might think that some people get tired of hearing about the, these discussions about um, tourism and you, you ask the question, well, why is, is tourism important um, anyway? Why is it important to the economy? And, and we believe it's important to have discussions like this because I think that there's still a, some misunderstanding of how an economy or a functioning economy is actually supposed to work. There's this prevailing notion that the government pumps money into the economy and people get contracts and all this kind of thing but that that's and to be fair to a considerable extent that is actually how our economy works but that is an artificial economy the economy an economy actually is supposed to earn money well people a lot of trainees a lot of citizens still equate the performance of the economy um, with how much money the government pumped into the system yeah and what is interesting is sometimes we don't ask where does that money come from yeah obviously some of it comes from taxes but the rest of it has to come from foreign exchange earnings mm. and that is why tourism is important and the lion's share of the, the foreign exchange earnings has traditionally come from the oil and gas sector mm -hmm. but just to, to 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 backtrack just for a little bit uh, what we're saying about perceptions about the economy and how it actually works this is not this is not something that we've pulled out of the air I've spoken to countless businessmen I, I, I recall that there was I think it was in 2016 I was speaking to countless uh, businessmen uh, who not not 2016 2014 
and they were complaining that the government of the day then was lagging in its responsibility to appoint the boards and I was asking, well, what, what, what does the appointing of the boards have to do with the smooth, efficient functioning of your business? Well, it was only upon the appointment of boards, state boards, that budgets would be established, and budgets for expenditure uh, in various ministries, various state agencies. And that is what all of the businesses were lining up for. They were lining up to wait to hear how much money was allocated by each ministry or each state agency so they could order their budgets and i thought well this is a really warped way to run an economy but unfortunately that is to a considerable extent how the economy functions in this country and that's why we believe that an important discussion has to be had about exploring tourism as a real means of diversification because we do need to earn money to keep the economy running or to have the economy run as it should and not in this artificial sense. And I think an easy way to explain it is when you go to work, you're there to earn money. Mm. When you operate a small business, you're in the shop selling things to earn money. And government revenue does not exist in some magical treasure chest in the treasury division. It is called the treasury. It's, it's, this, bu okay. <laughs> it's this building in Port of Spain. No one has ever gone inside, but if you open the door, there are people who look sort of like elves, and there's a all, big brown wooden. There's a big. There's an chest. actual chest with money. Oftentimes, when one government leaves office and another comes in, they go in there and they find it is empty. The treasure chest is it's, empty. It's they steal empty. All, all the money from all the, of the money chest. is stolen from this <laughs> mythical chest, and then it has to be somehow replenished. Uh, and that's uh, it, it sounds we're, we're being facetious but obviously because people don't have an understanding of where the revenue comes from to pay public servant salaries all of it comes from uh, to a considerable degree the foreign exchange earnings from the royalties that we are, that accrue from the oil and natural gas sector um, it's not the only source no, of, but of it's, foreign it's exchange but, but by, by and large it is the main source of, of foreign income uh, and that is why we believe that it's it's uh, it's not only it's always timely to have a, a a serious conversation about the importance of tourism to taking the burden off of this dependence. And it's also important to note that earning money is something we have to continue doing. Right. Yes. So you don't ever stockpile enough money to last you for generations. Mm -hmm. Earning money is something that we have to keep doing. Right now, oil and gas is not generating the kind of income we were accustomed to. So we, we, we should be treating tourism and other non-energy sectors with more urgency. What is also disheartening is uh, many people, particularly government ministers, past and present, uh, when, uh, for example, there are news reports of uh, new oil and gas projects coming on stream, for example, with the uh, impending uh, Angelin uh, gas platform that's meant to start producing uh, very soon. And I don't have the specifics. Uh, Kevin Ramnarine is the go-to on that one. Um, everyone looks at that as, okay, well, then the, the, the economy is going to magically right itself. But I think that that is a very dangerous fallback position. And it has been our position for decades. And that is because in part of our politics, how our politics operates. Most politicians uh, consider policy planning on a five-year cycle, which is the lifespan of their, their political party in, in government. And therefore, all they are concerned about is distributing the revenues that are attracted by uh, oil, the oil and natural gas sector. So it, it never seems as though we really invest the time and energy into planning for the long term. They're planning for the next election. They're not planning for future generations. You know, you know, and I think that's a huge disservice to the population. You know what, why I think that is? For the, for the majority of our history as an independent nation, our governments have had just to collect well, oil just collect and it. gas yeah. revenue and then decide how it's spent. Mm -hmm. In terms of building up non-energy sectors like tourism and like agriculture, you can't just go to the office and wait for the revenue to come in. Mm. You have to come up with strategy and then you have to execute that strategy. And that is something that we are not accustomed to doing. We're also not accustomed to, to I don't want to say we're not accustomed to being creative because carnival is a very uh, creative industry. Mm. But in terms of, of, of government strategy and government policy, we're basically 
laid back mm. in that all we do is wait for the oil and gas money to come in and then say, well, you get this and you get that and you get this amount. Yeah. So in terms of building an industry, I think we've become a little bit lazy. Again, and it's something that we're going to revisit a little later on, but the, 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 the concept of uh, drafting strategy and policy, it requires work. And I don't like that word policy. Well, it sounds very starchy and well, yes, um, <laughs> it's it's it's, it's a and word that, that that politicians like to use a lot uh, when they're not, well. It's it's a word that you use instead of actually doing something. So you say, well, we have our policies and plans in place, which means we ain't doing war on us, and that's basically what that means. But uh, what we have to talk about, can I? Ask? Anyway, it's too late. I can't ask. I can't say. Uh, so what we're going to talk about when we come back after this very short break is. Uh, another aspect of the problem of feelings in uh, addressing our needs for the tourism sector and that is our limited understanding of tourism now, that that does not strict, speak strictly to our limited understanding of what tourism is but it also addresses our limited understanding of what our tourism product is and i think that that is a real affliction in this country we don't even know who the hell we are so how are we going to sell ourselves to, to, to other countries other people tourists looking for an intriguing interesting destination that i think is and a huge problem a huge handicap i know we're going to break and the reason that is important is because we are not just competing with the rest of the caribbean mm. we are competing with the rest of the world yeah so you have to know your country you have to have an understanding of what is available to us to offer as a tourism product mm. to make us stand out in a very competitive industry. And there's so few, that, well, I, I don't want to say so few, there's so many Trinidadians who do not even know uh, their own country, but much worse, there are people who are in positions of authority who are mm -hmm. driving tourism policy who don't know themselves. So they don't know what they're selling. So we'll talk about those issues when we come back after this short break, folks, stay with us. 103fm.tt has gotten a facelift. Uh, get your questions and comments on it. Uh, Facebook Live might be down, but uh, WhatsApp, I think, is working quite well. So you can uh, get your questions and comments into us at 299-4103. That's 299-4103. Uh, let us know what you think about this um, this uh, tourism, the potential of tourism. There have been a lot of very interesting articles appearing um, uh, on oh, the Rad yeah, Radhika Radhika Supra, Supra, yes. from The Guardian, she started what seems to be a series mm -hmm. where she's going into these unknown and unexplored areas in South Trinidad yeah. um, that have a lot of tourism potential. She went into the Godino Swamp. Yeah, you know, it's funny. when we I went there, right? When you told me, when you told, yes, we've, we've actually been into the Godino Swamp. Uh, we spent um, several, several hours inside of there and still... And it's a wondrous place. Yeah, it's, it's but the amazing thing is that what we read about, when I when, when you told me about this article about five islands, I think about, but why is she writing about five islands in Chagaramas? But this is an entirely different um, area. There are actually islands inside of the Godino Swamp that have each has a different feature. Mm. So all of these are, too, but anyway, we're going to get into so all of the so, yeah, different- So um, we, we want to talk about our limited understanding right. of tourism. Mm -hmm. And at least in Trinidad and Tobago, when we talk tourism, we're thinking about carnival, we're thinking about well, sun, every, sand, and sea. Yeah, everybody. And then we like to throw in some ecotourism because it's a buzzword in the industry. Well, and people will also mention uh, in passing, well, we could do some business tourism, um, or there's or also some medical tourism, uh, you could also some go sports go, tourism. You could also, well, that is more talk than anything else. But mm -hmm. there's also, well, you could go zip lining down in, in, in Macquarie. But for the most part, it is carnival centered, it is maraca centered. Those are the, the crown jewels of the entire tourism product but those and are actually and then we sprinkle in some Karani Swamp and Azerite well uh, just in and passing. then Tobago for the beaches yeah so but, but that's the problem that we, we don't have a full appreciation for what tourism is the, what the tourism product is in Trinidad and Tobago and consequently how are you how can you expect either the people of Trinidad and Tobago or the government whichever one it is to adequately market the destination if they don't even know what we have to sell but the first question mm. we should be asking is what do we have to offer tourists to give them a memorable experience and, and that, i'm talking outside of carnival yeah that is the first thing we have to be asking we, we shouldn't be talking first about room stock and airlift and sandals we have to ask ourselves what is our tourism product yeah and if we asked ourselves that first then the magnificent seven the fort san andreas museum on south key the roads to grand river 
the rota is a right Karani swamp would not be in the horrible condition yeah that they're in and again that to me the condition of of the tourism infrastructure and the products associated uh, with them that we like to talk about again people always say that uh, Karani swamp is our premier eco tourism destination not not too long ago we went and we did a little blog on the state of the Karani Swamp and it was shock shocking. And listen, it's if falling I apart. could still be shocked in Trinidad and Tobago, I tell you, it was real shocking. I mm -hmm. mean, I uh, took a friend of mine is here from Montreal mm -hmm. and he um, he's interested in going to the Karani Swamp. But he had read the blog and he was, you know, he was he was sticking in some ridicule there and, and, and saying, you know, I, I want to go see the, you know, the, the, the rotting hulk of the boat down at the Karani Swamp. But he's saying that half jokingly, but he's a friend. What about the, the other people he's who aren't? Half Trini. He's also well, he, and he's half Trini too. Eh? What What are the other people who aren't as invested in the destination? People who pay to come here on vacation and they see this the state of affairs at the Karani Swamp and see how bad things are. But Karani Swamp is like uh, it's an it's an abandoned child or a bastard child of the tourism industry in that it's not really carefully considered because we what isn't a bastard child of the tourism industry well carnival and, and maracas beach as mentioned well they, they just did a quick fix up we, yes maracas, because we, because we, we also went to maracas right, in november and it was in a shocking state mm -hmm. but they but knowing that um there, there were going to be uh, hordes of, of tourists descending on the beach uh, for carnival they did and i'm grateful for that i'm glad because i was really embarrassed at the state of the beach but the fact of the matter is the state of our tourist uh, attractions, and they're not attractions because nothing has been done with them. The state of our tourist attractions is indicative of our mentality towards the tourism product because we don't see because these we're things not, as... Because we're not putting ourselves in the shoes of the tourists. We're not seeing Trinidad and Tobago through their eyes. Yeah. If we were, Karani, the Karani Swamp, and by that I mean the visitor center, would not be in the deplorable state that it is in. Mm. The the banisters have fallen down, the wood is rotting, it is um, overwhelmed by stray cats, mm. there are um, um, rotting chairs all over the compound, the signs are all um, faded. Well, they're faded. It's, it's almost like a game when you go there. Oh, yeah, guess what was on that sign? It's madness. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that we've I've written about for a long time and we've we've uh, grumbled and about I think for, if you if it, and it upsets me no end if I if I um if you're going to be talking about that the fact that Karani Swamp only comes alive at four o'clock well this is this is the craziest thing every afternoon a considerable investment was made in the Karani Swamp uh, s several years ago and I believe it was under the the uh, UNC the it was under the regime. UNC and right it was under the UNC administration and um, uh, viewing towers of considerable height were built inside of the swamp. Those have since crumbled to nothing because they were, I think, improperly uh, designed and they were, uh, weren't properly protected from the elements, so they've all rotted down to the ground. Mm -hmm. But since that center has been built, there's been very little maintenance. There's been zero, practically zero marketing, but you have a facility that only comes alive for roughly two hours of the day, and not even so because it is the swamp that receives the visitors but the visitor center people don't go there well i know before the visitor center was um closed temporarily or indefinitely i can't remember which one because of flooding mm. they would have school tours yeah but then when you go inside the visitor center no offense but it is a very boring mm -hmm. Um, unimaginative tour yeah you know so there's so much that we can do that you know we can we can put in bird feeders to attract birds to to the center we can put in more interactive tours I mean we always joke about the fact that when you go to the the eating area mm. they have these very rudimentary displays crab yeah fish otter we mm. can do better than that. Mm. Well, I don't know because I think that we're doing the best we can. Based no, on no, 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 no. I think we just have a lazy approach to it. Well, uh, and that's that's the main problem. Now, uh, there's wildlife in the Kyrene Swamp 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. There is something to see uh, throughout the day in that place. Yet, we only think of the Kyrene Swamp in the context of the return the of, the, of, the, the, of the, the, the Scarlet Ibis to their roosts for the evening. Mm -hmm. So you have the boats taking uh, these... Um, groups of tourists out in the evening but what happens for the the rest of the day now the the, the visitor center was built with a gazebo at the back to me that place can be fixed up and as Narissa was discussing it can be optimized to have more visitors you can sell t-shirts you can sell 
Well, you can I, sell, I can't you can, really sell a stuffed you, color because no, I wouldn't make much of a, a, a toy. But you can sell um, local foods, local drinks, right. uh, sada roti, um, fry bacon, something uh, mm. local. What we call cocoa tea, mm. um, fresh fruit juices. Right. So the idea is to really maximize the tourism product by sitting down and listen. What we've just discussed there. This is that we, we're not we're not splitting atoms here. This is really just basic stuff. I'm quite sure there are people with expertise in crafting a tourism product who could come up with something even more dynamic. But we've just been in the environment. We have been visiting the Kearney Swamp for many, many years because we have shot television programs there over the course of two, three years. So we understand the area and we understand what the true potential is. And we know for a fact that it is it is being underutilized. You can get better revenue out of it if you were to put some thought into the Kearney Swamp product. And that is true of practically every destination in this country. I, I think back to um, the work that we have done in, in Paramin. Mm -hmm. It is amazing that in Paramin, Mount Vigie is, is the highest point in Paramin and it has some of the most breathtaking views you can possibly find in this country. And you will be shocked if you if you're actually to, able to make it to the top of that mountain without which is a scary drive it's a, it's a, little, a little scary for, for, <laughs> for people who are not comfortable uh, driving on on steep hills but if you could actually make it to the top of that mountain you will find that there is not a bench in sight the only thing that could be accused of being a bench is a plank of wood laid over two bricks and that wasn't put there by the Ministry of uh, Tourism and it wasn't put there by the, the well, whatever what the, what, incarnation of the, the TDC is now. What the, what the TDC did, though, was they put up some lovely signs. Some, well, that, which are by now faded. Now, Mount Viji, uh, that is also where you get to the Shodo Bay. Hikers go there to get down to um, Shodo Bay. It is one of the, apparently one of the most beautiful, it's a pretty strenuous hike. It's what you would call a Category 5 hike. But it is one of the most beautiful bays there is in this country. But then, the first thing that you see up there is this giant, big, beautiful, faded sign that had been put up there uh, many years ago by the Tourism Authority. Now, if they'd taken half of that money that was in, because I know that that cost decent money, half of the money they put up in a sign that is now guesswork, and they put a couple benches there to let people go and sit down, have lunch, have a picnic or something. But as it is right now, visitors to Mount Vigie, if you come, if you reach late for the bench, you had to sit on the ground. Or on a rock. Or on a rock. And yeah. those rocks aren't particularly comfortable because, because they're rocks. You know, but it reminds me, uh, I um, took someone to Paramin, they heard of Paramin and they wanted to visit Paramin. And I warned them, I said, listen, Paramin is a beautiful place. But when you go there, you can't get anything to eat and there are no toilet facilities. Mm. So the person kept insisting, no, 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 I'll be fine. I want to go. Mm. So before we got to Paramin, we stopped off and we, we got some food to take up to Paramin to eat. Yeah. And then when we got to Paramin, we had to basically stand and eat the food. Yeah. And the person said, but there's nowhere to sit. Well, like she didn't, be, she, she didn't believe <laughs> she you. She said, you have, you have to be crazy. <laughs> you have to be crazy. So there we are standing on, on the streets eating, well, we went up with roti, eating mm. roti. Uh, drinking our drinks and you know it's, it's just mind-blowing now there are days that we've because I used to do a lot of shooting up at Mount Viji because as I said the, the views are, are breathtaking uh, and there have been many days that we've gone up there that we would see you know groups of people visiting and all of them are sitting down in the Timari I don't know how people are sitting down in Timari all of them sitting down on the Timari spread out on the rocks all of this kind of thing like iguanas and, and I can't for the life of me think why no one thought it suitable to invest in three benches, the Spancrete benches, put them up there, indestructible, last forever. And toilet facilities. And That's a major problem whenever we take well, visitors across yes. the country. That is, uh, we, well, we should mention at this stage that we are sort of, um, well, we, we're sort of unofficial uh, tour guides. Unpaid. Uh, well, un un unpaid. Un unpaid. <laughs> because we have been... We do it because we love our country. Yeah, we, we, because we've produced television shows that explore um, the country, we know a lot of the areas that most trainees are not familiar with. So whenever mm -hmm. we have friends and family visiting from abroad, we become these unofficial tour guides. And this is something that, that struck... Because I have friends visiting from um, Montreal right now. And, and this is something that, that struck me. If somebody were to book a two-week vacation, that's a long vacation. I don't know if people even get vacations that long now. But if somebody were to book a two-week vacation in Trinidad and Tobago, I guarantee you, I could find something for you riveting to do every single day of that week. And maybe two days out of that, two weeks would be by the beach. You could, I could find something for you interesting, intriguing, and completely original. And also something that you would not expect 
in a Caribbean island. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the beauty, the untouched, untapped, and unknown beauty of Trinidad and Tobago as a tourist destination. It is multifaceted. We have not just the destinations, but we have the uh, festivals, we have the culture, the food. We are really, truly unique in the Caribbean, but we do not, we, we see, it's something that we seem to take for granted. Uh, we ignore it and therefore we do not monetize it. And this is also something that, and this is a real pet peeve that I have. This is something that is reflected in the marketing that we do of the destination. Go, you go on the interwebs and you look at the ads that are done for by, by these guest houses. The ads are generally used well, they use pictures of hotel rooms, the pictures of, if it's a guest house, there will be pictures of the beautiful beds with the nice bedspread. Of the lobby. I am not, Trinidad, Trinidad is, compared to some of the, uh, the other destinations in the Caribbean, Trinidad is at the furthest end of the chain. Mm -hmm. I am not going to travel, spend all of that money and travel all the way to Trinidad because your bed looking soft. That doesn't make it, I have a bed at home. You have to show me pictures of the destination you have to show me video that is going to make me want to come there show me something that captivates my interest and my imagination and a hotel bed was, and, and then they, they, they share another picture well this room is our deluxe suite mm -hmm. that that is not it is a highly competitive environment right now and we have to do much better than showing pictures of a hotel room and the, the hotel grounds with the pool and all of that. People, people are over that now. We mm -hmm. have to now go out there and compete against our Caribbean neighbors and people in the rest of the world. But again, the kind of marketing that I'm talking about is informed by our lack of understanding of the product, of the destinations, of the activities that are out there for people to do. Well, that's in terms of hotel marketing, but then when we get to the tourism marketing by the state agencies, I, I was going to say TDC, I can't remember the new bodies now. Mm. We like to do this generic video ad every couple of years, Trinidad and Tobago, the land of Calypso, mm. Steel Pan and the Hummingbird. Yeah. Again, it shows that we don't have an understanding of the tourism market out there. That's too generic. Yeah. And it's, it's not going to lure people from, let's say, instead of going to Russia or instead of going to Vietnam or instead of going to South Africa or instead of going to Kenya or instead of going to Costa Rica, mm. I'm going to come to Trinidad. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's boring marketing. Well, we're going to talk a bit more about marketing and, and what um, the industry players can do in, in the area of marketing. But you talked about the, the, the government's response, the government's marketing, which uh, local hoteliers have complained is abysmal. And in fact, as far as they're concerned, the, the, the government is not doing any marketing whatsoever. And that they believe that this has contributed significantly to uh, egregious declines in tourist arrivals. I think that that is one part of the problem, but it's not it's not just that. But marketing, we, we, we do certainly fall very short when it comes to marketing on the government side of things. But local businesses have a responsibility to and on the, their, again, their own marketing. Again, on the government side of things, we don't understand our product. Mm -hmm. You know, so for instance, uh, we were doing a shoot at Orange Valley. It was the first time we had gone to Orange Valley because we heard that there were flamingos there. Mm -hmm. And when we got to Orange Valley, we were blown away by the amount of wildlife that we saw at as Orange it, Valley. As and it turns it out, a fair number of those flamingos, excuse me, a oh, fair number short. of those mm -hmm. flamingos were blown away themselves by hunters who got, but anyway, that's, that's a different problem, but go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we were blown away by the amount of wildlife that we saw mm -hmm. at Orange Valley, which inspired us to do an impromptu video. Yeah. And what occurred after that video? We had several ministers Everybody was everybody was interested. Yes, yes. Going to visit Orange Valley, but the uh, the, the sad thing is, after they got their photo op, mm. um, that was the end of it. Mm. Because in the video we mentioned that there was so much potential for turning this into an eco tourist spot. Mm -hmm. We could have built um, a wooden boardwalk through the mangrove, put up um, birding blinds. Um, what do you call the thing that you you look through to see? Um, the birds. You mean like a binoculars? No, no, no. They, they, they put it on the boardwalks. Oh, I don't know, but, but I get, I get yeah. what you're saying. So in other words, the place could be outfitted and equipped to attract bird watchers. Now, bird watching is a multi-million-dollar global industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the quality of that tourist is exceptional because they are generally people who are older. Uh, many of them retired. They take their savings to travel the world to pursue a hobby that is almost like a serious addiction. So not only does that mean that they're going to spend money when they come, 
but they're going to return to the destination if they find it to be appealing. That is why the birding market is so important to Trinidad and Tobago. And people, the people who operate Acerite and other um, small guest houses that uh, function in Trinidad with ecotourism as their a main part of their model, they understand that. But the country as a whole has seen that has that is lost on the authorities who have the marketing budgets to really push this country as a birding destination. But what we do have is ministers technocrats traveling the world staying on in taxpayers on taxpayers dollars staying in fancy hotels uh, uh, and eating continental breakfasts and not learning anything from all of these travels except to go and hand out flyers and as far as i'm concerned when you hand out a flyer so that's like saying hey you throw this away that is that is the sum total of our our outreach to the international community we, we're not really learning not just about our own tourist product but about the market out there and how to to, to micro target these different but, but back to the to the orange valley video that we did outlining all these um things that could have been done to turn it into an ecotourism uh, product mm -hmm. and then after the video aired and it got some attention online we had these ministers of the previous government coming to orange valley and talking about turning it into an ecotourist spot after they got their photo up nothing happened Radhika Sukraj did a story on a salt water volcano in Rio Claro. Which I, we weren't even aware existed. Which is a, a, a fascinating attraction in itself. And in the story, she mentioned that uh, the agriculture minister, Clarence Rambarad, visited the site a couple of years ago. Mm. So they are aware of the no, site. No, that in itself is not remarkable because it ain't hard to get Rambarad to visit anything. I mean, he would he would attend the opening of a stamp pipe, <laughs> to be quite honest. He's the minister of photo ops, yeah, right? Yeah, he is the minister of photo ops. He, he's your man if you need a minister to show up on a Sunday morning in Mayaro to, to, to launch a new goat. <laughs> so, but, but the, the point is that people will... And, and we're not accusing this government of doing it more than the next because they all do it. Mm. We gave you the example of Orange Valley. Everybody showed up with much fanfare. Uh, um, they, they were flanked by a huge numbers of ministry officials and the, the flash bulbs were going off and at the, end of, uh, at the end of the day nothing was done and the sad thing about it is that Orange Valley is visited more often by people dumping garbage than tourists it is, it's horrible and we, are, we know that because we actually went there to, to participate in a cleanup I mean it's, it's amazing how we uh, disrespect these sites that can earn us money, but not only earn us money, but support communities and create local economies. Because as I don't know if people are aware, but trickle-down econo economics does not actually work. So the way to really achieve true economic diversification and to, to build economies throughout the country is by building economies within these communities where people can have their own cottage industries based on marketing their own assets, which in the case of Orange Valley, is the, or, for the, instance, the, the, the birding. Another favorite location that we like to go to is Cedrus and Icarcus. Yeah, that is that is another mind blowing uh, destination because, uh, and the first time that we went there, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say it was only really a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, given that I've been on this planet for so long and, and uh, on this um, this island seemingly a hell of a lot longer, uh, that when we went there and we drove on a road through. Uh, the, one of the most beautiful wetland environments you could ever see in this country and yet it it, it it just exists nothing is really done with it and there's dumping there too by the way nothing is really done with it nobody and, and Trinidadians you know when we go there to, to, to shoot videos or to take pictures Trinidadians will pass by and say boy this is really fantastic it's such a beautiful place I've never been here before and then they go their way and then nothing is really ever done with it but before we run out of time, we, we also need to mention we still have some time. We the have fact that the fact that we're also not making any investment, minutes. we're not making any investment in the infrastructure to support these tourist destinations. So uh, if you think about the drive to uh, Grand River to see the turtles, man, that, that is a bone jangling drive because mm -hmm. the road is simply is very poorly maintained. So apart from the road, the state of the roads, there are no, there, there, there are very few suitable rest stops, and it is very embarrassing to be entertaining uh, people from other countries, and trying to find a suitable ditch for them to pee in. And I'm, I, I know it sounds crass, but it's the truth. 
Because it is better to pee in a ditch than to pee in some of them bars on, on, on the way to these far-flung destinations. And that is an embarrassing state of affairs that we should be in at this stage. But that is because we... Again, we've... we don't put ourselves in the shoes of the tourists. We don't see things through their eyes. Mm. Okay, so they would need a, 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 a clean place to go use the bathroom, to, to stop off and get something to eat, to, to get out the car and just stretch their legs. And and that is, is done so sparingly. I mean... When uh, the, 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 there was a facility uh, constructed at the Manzanilla facility there, the beach, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. The bathrooms lock up most of the time. It's, you know, you have to catch your, you, you have to um, take your chances with the rose corn outside on the road. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that when we come back after this short break and talk about some possible solutions, what people could... Because, you know, we're not just about the belly aching. We are about the belly aching, but we also like to talk about the solutions if we can. So stay with us, folks. We'll be right back. Okay, so we got two com comments. Um, hi, all those agencies who hold tours should help with the cleaning of the Karani Swamp. Um, they're supposed to be paying a tax for using it, but they use it as well. The Ministry of Tourism can't do everything. We ain't asking the Ministry of Tourism to do everything, you know. But it should be a must to keep it clean, whether it be rubbish or clearing of the rivers. It should give us a, a take in uh, situation. What are they doing with the money that they collect from the tour groups? It should be put towards the cleaning of the Karani Swamp. Oh, that person's a crazy it's person. It's $40 to go into the Karani Swamp. That person's a crazy person. And they, what people don't know is that the tour operators themselves, like Narvin, they pick up rubbish. Mm -hmm. What we are talking about is the visitor center. Right, so Damien said, good afternoon. What tourism, after shutting down of Petrotrain, the government form of diversity is in the police and licensing officers issuing tickets. So that's the new source of major income for Trayantin. No, I agree with that. So I don't know if you want to refer to that. Well, we can forget you for this one, because that's stupid. No, but you should say something. Mm. If, if they are required to pay a tax to use the Karani Swamp, then the Karani Swamp has to be, um, the infrastructure has to be improved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that they would have, if, if there would have to be proper jetties, proper dredging of the, the, the channels. So yeah, I don't think that they would object to it. If, and if they would also have to do more marketing. Mm. Yeah. Because right now it's the tour operators who do the majority of marketing for the Karani Swamp and yeah. not the government. Welcome back, folks. You're listening to Blue Soap Sessions. We've been talking about tourism, or lack thereof, in Trinidad and Tobago. And we're going to, in just a moment, talk about some of the possible solutions and strategies to uh, really start going after this, what I believe to be a, a really viable um, plank in the thrust towards uh, economic diversification. And before I forget, I, I recently heard somebody, well, somebody in response to a column that I'd written said, Listen, tourism is not going to tourism is not going to take the place of oil and natural gas. Well, nobody ever said it's supposed to take the place of oil and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Tourism is supposed to be one of many different things we do. Tourism, agriculture, many different things. Mm -hmm. So let's just get that notion out of the way. Um, let's take a, a comment that we got on the WhatsApp uh, from Navin. Hi, all those agencies who hold tours should help with the cleaning of the Karani Swamp. They're supposed to be paying a tax for using it, but they use it as well. Um, the Ministry of Tourism can't do everything, but it should be a must to keep it clean, whether it be rubbish or clearing the rivers, it should be... Who is asking the Ministry of Tourism to do everything, though? We're mm. asking them to do something. Well, yeah, and, well that, that's the thing. I mean, do we, something! No, we understand that this, we understand that building a country, building a successful society is a partnership between the state and the people. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a huge imbalance. Uh, with the state not holding up its end of the bargain, at least in the area of tourism. Uh, so what, what Navin is asking is, what are they, and by they I assume he is referring to the tour operators, what the are they doing swamp, yeah. with the, the money and they should, they should be attacked? You know what, I would not be opposed to the imposition of a tax on, um, on the people who operate their businesses in the swamp, but for that to happen, there have to be proper serviceable jetties there has to be regular dredging of the channel so that they can operate their boats uh, efficiently. There has to be security so that their boat engines are not stolen, which they are. Um, also, the, uh, faci the, the waterways would have to be clean because they don't have the resources or the equipment as to operators to clean. The, the, but also the visitor center would have to be maintained and 
Um, and just as important, the government would have to do its part to market Karani Swamp as a destination because right now it is the tour operators, the private tour operators at Karani Swamp who are marketing the destination via social media, via their websites. Mm. So if you want these tour operators to pay a tax, that's fine, but you have to give them something in return. Yeah, it, it, that would be tantamount to asking us as motorists to pay a road tax but not repair any roads. And we do that. We do pay a road tax. So why not, right? Yeah. Uh, another um, comment. Uh, what? Da from Damien Rampasad. From Damien Rampasad. Good afternoon. What tourism after shutting down Petrotrain, the government form of diversity, is the police and licensing officers issuing tickets? So that's the new source of major income for Trinidad and Tobago. That's funny because <laughs> actually that started long before they shut down Petrotrain. There, there's the, almost a permanent police post by the Arangwe Savannah. Heads up, folks. Three o'clock in the afternoon. If you um, if you're not right up with all of your documents, don't pass by the Arangwa so far because they will hold you. Or the Arangwa's roundabout or off the, the highway. Right, yeah. I mean, they, they might as well put up a little booth there because they, they're always there to, um, trying to raise funds for the government. Uh, but anyway, so uh, let's talk a bit about um, what can be done. What are, what are the solutions? And um, let's talk for a moment about marketing. Uh, we don't like this throw your hands up in the air nothing can be done about it and I think that even as smaller industry players mid-sized uh, mid-sized tour operators uh, guest houses hotel owners uh, it is it, it can be daunting to mount a marketing campaign it can also be costly depending on the kind of marketing you're doing but it, it can be daunting to do it on your own if you got together and pooled your resources to do a, a proper marketing campaign because remember marketing is not doing one video one ad and putting it out there it has to be done throughout the year every year throughout the existence of every, your business every week that is what marketing is that yeah. and that is how that is what tourism marketing is you would be able to manage that if you were to assemble your because there are all, there are already um, associations. There's, yeah, there's they, a tour operators group. Right. They, um, so small if you, bed and breakfast group. Right, but the problem is many of these groups leave it to the government to handle all of the marketing. The government does have some responsibility, but you have responsibility. And those yourself. who are doing marketing, because there are a lot of uh, players in the industry who are doing their own marketing, mm -hmm. they're doing it on an individual basis, and that can become overwhelming. So there are private people, private um, businesses in tourism who have been doing their mm. own marketing and that's the only reason they still exist yeah, yeah. because they are able to attract visitors to either their, their tour packages or, or their um, hotels and, and guest houses. Yeah. So what we are proposing um, and it's something that we've talked about for a very long time is really getting together, pooling your resources and that way you can um, probably engage the services it's, you don't necessarily have to but you can engage the services of someone who is an expert in marketing uh, social media marketing building websites because that's what it's going to take you're going to have to have a multi-pronged approach to reaching out to those markets because that's how uh, tourists today do their destination shopping they go on the interwebs and they look at the stories that other countries tell about themselves. We aren't telling any stories about ourselves, basically. We're we doing like this, hey, look me here, come here and check out what we have. That, that doesn't work anymore. They, there's a different, the, the tourist today is a different creature. They want you to tell them a story about what makes you unique and what makes you different. And uh, finally, what I think is- as, I think as ordinary citizens mm -hmm. who are not necessarily involved in tourism, what we need to do yeah. is read up on what's going on out there in the industry yeah and why should we do that so we can contribute to a more knowledgeable discussion on tourism and also so we can hold accountable the people we've put in charge to grow our tourism industry right so and, and that's important because you do not want the one minister after the next come in and selling you on this blue flag designation for a beach nonsense or talking about the last conference that we had and sent and sharing and they pictures. love they, they love to go to to, to these um tourism events itb berlin and world travel market and they can't ever tell you what what we've gotten out of it what we can expect to get out of it if you uh, inform yourself and it's not hard to do because there are numerous publications um online just google costa rica yeah well that's it there, there are many examples of of uh 
Caribbean islands, Caribbean countries, destinations that are doing it the right way. So it's important to educate yourself so that we know what we can demand, what we must demand of our leaders, and they wouldn't be able to bamboozle us with the nonsense that they're doing right now. Folks, that We've is our... We've run out of time. Tourism is a, a topic that we can talk about for months on end, <laughs> so it's very difficult to squeeze it into the time frame that we have, but we're grateful that you were able to spend some time with us, and I hope that you continue discussing the topic uh, with your friends and family um, when you have the time. So that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much for being with us. Bye for now, guys. Remember, next Wednesday at 12.15 p.m. Yeah.